In 1939, LaGrange, Illinois, witnessed a silent showdown. A mountain of black steam pitched against a sleek new diesel machine, the EMDFT. Railroad men scoffed. Yet within 10 years, this hum of progress would erase steam locomotives from American rails forever. How did one locomotive end an era devoted to fire and coal, turning legends into memories and entire towns obsolete almost overnight? This is the story behind the locomotive that silenced steam forever and the engineering gamble that reshaped a nation's destiny. Richard Dilworth believed the answer was simple. If you wanted to beat steam, you had to rethink the very way a locomotive made power. Steam engines pushed and pulled with pistons and rods, all thunder in motion, every part exposed and straining. But the EMDFT was different. Inside its streamlined shell, a diesel engine spun a generator. That generator sent electricity flowing down heavy cables to traction motors mounted right on the axles. No more drive rods, no more clanking linkages. The force that moved the train was now invisible, humming quietly through copper and steel. Each traction motor could be controlled with precision, delivering smooth, steady torque to every wheel. On a steep grade or a slick rail, the FT didn't slip and stumble like steam. The electric motors gripped the rails and pulled with a strength that felt almost effortless. Power wasn't lost in a tangle of gears and rods. It went straight from the diesel engine to the rails, through the generator and motors, every watt accounted for. This new system brought more than just efficiency. It meant less wear and tear, fewer breakdowns, and a locomotive that could run day and night with barely a pause. The FT's modular design allowed multiple units to be coupled together and operated from a single cab. One engineer, one fireman. Where steam had demanded crews for every engine in a long freight consist. This was a revolution in labor as much as machinery. The secret was in the architecture. The diesel engine never touched the wheels directly. Instead, it became a power plant, feeding a network of electric motors that did the real work. That's how the FT could haul more freight, burn less fuel, and keep running while steam engines cooled their heels in the roundhouse. The old rules no longer applied. Electricity, not steam, was now king of the rails. Inside the FT's car body, the heart of the revolution beat in 16 synchronized cylinders. The EMD 567 engine, named for its 567 cubic inches of displacement per cylinder, was unlike anything the railroad world had seen. Instead of brute size, it relied on clever engineering, compact, efficient, and designed for the realities of freight service, each cylinder fired every revolution, thanks to a two-stroke cycle that delivered a steady, relentless surge of power. A roots blower forced air through the engine, ensuring every cylinder got a full charge, no matter how hard the locomotive worked. This wasn't just about making horsepower, though the FT delivered 1,350 out of a single unit. It was about making that power last, mile after mile, year after year. The real genius lay in how the engine was built. Instead of one massive block, the 567 was a collection of modular power assemblies. Each assembly, piston, rod, liner, and head, could be lifted out and replaced in a matter of hours. For railroad mechanics used to days lost over a cracked steam cylinder or a leaking boiler, this was a revelation. If a cylinder failed, the crew swapped it out and sent the locomotive back on the line. If you're enjoying what you've seen so far, I hope you'll consider subscribing. It helps me preserve the history of these remarkable machines for future generations. Now, let's continue. No need for lengthy shop time or specialized labor. This modularity meant railroads could keep their diesels running with a skeleton crew and a stockpile of spare parts, even in the middle of nowhere. Richard Dilworth and his team built the 567 not just to run, but to be rebuilt over and over. The engine's V16 layout balanced power and size, fitting neatly inside the streamlined FT shell. Its uniflow scavenging kept exhaust and intake separate, while the crankcase, cast in rigid iron, absorbed the pounding of 16 pistons without complaint. Over time, EMD would refine the 567, but the core idea, maximum power in a serviceable, swappable package, remained the same. The FT's engine wasn't just a machine, 
it was a promise that the diesel era would be one of uptime, not downtime. And for railroads battered by the demands of war and the shortages of labor, that promise would prove irresistible. The EMDFT's demonstration tour began as a quiet departure from La Grange, but it quickly became a spectacle that swept across the country. In less than a year, the FT covered 83,764 miles, more distance than twice around the equator, pulling heavy freight on the main lines of 20 different railroads. The route wound from the Alleghenies to the Rockies, over mountain passes that had humbled generations of steam. In Colorado, the FT climbed the Moffat Tunnel Line. In Montana, it muscled a 17-car train up Bozeman Hill. On the Erie Railroad, it routinely handled more tonnage than the biggest Berkshires and did it with just a single crew. At every division point, the FT was met by crowds, railroad men in oil-stained overalls, local families, newspaper reporters, and skeptics from the roundhouse. The old hands watched with arms folded, their faces a mix of doubt and curiosity. They measured the FT not by its paint or its promises, but by what it could do on their rails. The FT answered with numbers, not words. Dynamometer cars logged every pound of tractive effort, every gallon of fuel, every mile run without a hiccup. In Santa Fe's territory, the FT ran 12,871 miles in just 32 days, pausing only for fuel and oil. Where steam engines needed hours for servicing, the FT was ready to roll again in less than an hour. As the tour wore on, the data piled up. Railroad executives pored over the reports. More tonnage moved, fewer crew changes, less downtime. Shop foremen who had doubted the FT's durability watched as it shrugged off grades and weather that left even the best steam engines wheezing. By the time the tour ended, the FT had left its mark on every major railroad in the country. The skepticism that greeted it in LaGrange had begun to give way, not to enthusiasm, but to a quiet, grudging respect. The numbers were impossible to ignore, and the future was rolling down the main line, humming instead of hissing. Santa Fe's management didn't just watch the FT roll through their territory. They started asking hard questions. Could this machine really conquer the grades between Chicago and Los Angeles? Could it handle the long, heavy freights that defined Western railroading? The answers came in numbers, 12,871 miles in just over a month, with barely a hiccup. But the Santa Fe's engineers saw something else in the FT's design, a blank space where the future could fit. They wanted more than a locomotive that could pull. They wanted a locomotive that could stop safely on mountain grades where a runaway meant disaster. That's when Santa Fe made a demand that changed diesel locomotives forever. They insisted that their first order of FTs include a new feature, dynamic braking. Instead of relying solely on friction brakes, the FT's traction motors could be switched to generators, turning the train's momentum into electric resistance and bleeding off speed without wearing out the brake shoes. It was a concept borrowed from electric interurbans, but never before applied to a mainline freight diesel. EMD's engineers got to work, collaborating directly with Santa Fe's technical staff. The result was a system that let the FT descend the steepest grades with control and confidence, even with a full load behind it. Santa Fe's procurement records from late 1940 show the first production FTs, numbered 100 through 103, arriving with dynamic braking as standard equipment. This wasn't just a safety feature, it was a selling point. Other railroads took notice. Suddenly, dynamic braking became the new benchmark for freight diesels, and EMD made it available across the FT line. The demonstration tour had proven the FT could pull like a champion, but Santa Fe's insistence on dynamic braking proved it could stop like one, too. With that, the FT was no longer just an experiment. Orders started coming in, not just from Santa Fe, but from railroads across the continent. The skepticism that had greeted the FT in LaGrange was fading fast. Now the question wasn't whether to buy a diesel, but how many, and how soon they could be delivered. The age of steam was slipping away, one signed order at a time. Production at Lagrange didn't just keep pace with demand. It set an entirely new standard for locomotive manufacturing. 
In the six years from 1939 to 1945, EMD built 1,096 FT units. That number tells only part of the story. Of those, 555 were cab-equipped A units, the lead locomotives with windshields, control stands, and the classic bulldog nose. The other 541 were cabless B boosters, designed to be coupled in any combination the railroad needed. Each booster carried the same 1,350 horsepower engine as the cab units, but without a cab or controls, they existed solely to add muscle. Railroads could order AB sets, ABBA consists, or any mix to match their freight demands. This modular approach fit perfectly with the assembly line methods General Motors had perfected in the auto industry. Instead of building one-off machines by hand, EMD's workers assembled FTs from standardized components, modular engines, traction motors, electrical cabinets, moving down the line in a steady flow. Sub-assemblies arrived just in time, bolted together, tested, and rolled out the door. Where steam builders took months to craft a single locomotive, EMD delivered FTs by the trainload, each unit nearly identical to the last. The numbers on the production floor were staggering for the era. At peak wartime output, dozens of FT units moved through the plant each month. Production logs from 1944 show lines of A and B units, stretching out of the shop doors, painted in railroad colors and ready for immediate service. Every completed unit meant another steam engine on borrowed time. The sheer volume overwhelmed even the most optimistic projections from a decade earlier. By the end of 1945, the FT was more than a locomotive. It was a fixture on American rails, as common as boxcars and just as essential. The scale of production wasn't just a technical achievement, it was the physical reality that made dieselization unstoppable. Freight trains thundered through the heart of wartime America, their schedules unbroken and their cargo vital. The EMDFT became the backbone of this relentless movement. While steam engines paused for water and servicing, FTs rolled on, delivering coal, steel, ammunition, and food to factories and ports around the clock. On the busiest main lines, dispatchers routed FT consists in endless rotation, one train arriving as another departed, the locomotives barely cooling between runs. Wartime audits from the Association of American Railroads recorded that diesels like the FT moved nearly 300 billion ton miles of freight each year, a staggering feat of logistics made possible by their endurance. Maintenance intervals stretched to new records. Where a steam locomotive needed a major overhaul every 15,000 to 20,000 miles, FT units routinely ran more than 100,000 miles before coming off the line for heavy work. Mechanics swapped out modular power assemblies in hours, not days, keeping the fleet in constant motion. The 567 engine's reliability became legendary among shop crews. Reports from the period show that FT units spent less than 5% of their time out of service for maintenance. Steam engines, by comparison, could be sidelined up to 20% of the time. For the men in the cab, the difference was more than mechanical. Diesel crews faced new routines, checking oil levels, monitoring gauges, logging long hours without the heat or grime of the firebox. On the radio, dispatchers tracked FT sets as they crossed division after division, moving war material and troops with a consistency that steam could never match. The War Production Board took notice. EMD received priority allocations for steel and materials, ensuring that FT production continued, even as other locomotive builders slowed. By 1945, the FT had become the standard bearer for reliability, running day and night while the nation depended on every ton delivered. The numbers told the story. More freight moved, fewer breakdowns, and a railroad system that never slept. Steam crews once worked in teams of four or five, each man with a job passed down from father to son. On a steam run, the engineer watched the rails ahead, the fireman shoveled coal, the brakeman moved between cars, and the head-end man kept an ear on the boiler's song. Every arrival meant hours in the roundhouse, wiping down rods, checking valves, oiling bearings, 
coaxing life from a machine that needed constant care. With the FT, all that changed. Now two or three men ran a train that once needed double the hands. The firebox sat cold and empty. The fireman's shovel hung on a nail, untouched. Old heads spoke of the rituals lost, the smell of hot oil, the hiss of steam at dawn, the pride in keeping a giant alive mile after mile. The FT didn't need tending, just a check of the gauges and a turn of the key. Some men adapted, learning new routines, but many were left behind. A composite voice from those days lingers. We used to be a crew. Now it's just a cab and a checklist. The hum of diesel meant fewer jobs, fewer stories told over midnight coffee, and a craft that once defined a life now slipping into memory. Coal once powered the nation's railroads, feeding thousands of steam engines and the industries that supplied them. But as the FT and its diesel successors multiplied, entire supply chains began to unravel. Railroads no longer needed mountains of coal delivered to every division point. Fueling stations for diesel appeared almost overnight, while water towers and coaling docks stood abandoned. The consequences rippled far beyond the rails. Coal traffic, once the backbone of American freight, dropped sharply. Mines that had shipped steady loads to railroads for decades saw contracts dry up. Refineries and oil distributors, on the other hand, ramped up production to meet the new demand for diesel fuel, shifting the balance of energy in the country. Legacy builders struggled to adapt. Baldwin Locomotive Works and Lima Hamilton, giants of the steam era, watched their order books empty. Their expertise in hand-built steam engines meant little in a world running on modular diesels and assembly lines. By the mid-1950s, both companies exited locomotive manufacturing altogether. Factories that once echoed with the clang of steel and the hiss of steam fell silent. Their skilled workers left searching for a place in the new order. The diesel revolution didn't just change how trains moved. It rewrote the rules for entire industries. By 1955, nearly every major American railroad had retired steam from mainline service. A change driven by the EMDFT's 83,764-mile national demonstration and the 1,096 units built during World War II. The FT's modular 567 engine and diesel-electric design proved more reliable, easier to maintain, and required fewer crew than any steam locomotive in operation. Yet, while company records and government audits confirm these efficiencies, the personal stories of thousands displaced by this shift remain less documented. Historians agree the FT's introduction marked a turning point, not just for technology, but for entire communities built around steam. Today, preserved steam engines stand as reminders of a world transformed by industrial innovation. The legacy of the FT is visible across America's rail network, quieter, more efficient, and fundamentally changed. The evidence is clear. The FT did not just replace steam locomotives. It closed an era, marking the point when American railroads embraced a new standard for progress. Thank you for watching. If you had the chance to work on one of these, or if you remember hearing that distinctive sound, I'd be genuinely interested to hear your story in the comments. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please do subscribe. There's much more to come.